Surprise, Monster Hunter. It's me, MT, and welcome back to the Heavy Spoiler Show, y'all. Great to have you back. This is going to be a breakdown of a very reflective episode 4 of Monarch Legacy of Monsters that teases a big connection to Godzilla vs. Kong while also diving into the characters of Mei and Kentaro, how they met, and a little more about what matters the most to them in this world. All while everybody tries not to freeze to death while running from a giant mole monster. A mole monster that wants to suck them off this plane of existence. Lots to talk about, so let's get into it. The episode starts with an introduction of a new character on the scene, Monarch Research Agent Barnes, played by Jess Salgado, who has starred in other hit sci-fi shows such as The Expanse and is probably most famously known for her role as the quickly liquefied Robin Ward on the hit Amazon TV show The Boys. When we first meet Barnes, she's chilling on a beach in Utah right outside of Monarch Trailer Outpost 47 in the modern day of 2015 listening to the 1992 hit Baby Got Back by Sir Mix-a-Lot and reading a copy of Neuromancer, which is a 1984 sci-fi novel by William Gibson. Barnes seems to be a bit of a voracious reader of science and historical fiction as the mini library in her Monarch research trailer also includes 2015's Armada by Ernest Cline, 2000's Revelation Space by Alastair Reynolds, 1974's The Moat in God's Eye by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, 2001's Kingdom of Cages by Sarah Zettel, 2001's Time Quake by Kurt Kirk Vonnegut, 2002's Ancient Encounters, Kennewick Man and the First Americans by James C. Chatters, 2010's Zero History by William Gibson again, 1982's The Cyborg and the Sorcerers by Lawrence Watt Evans, 2003's Quicksilver, and 1994's Interface by Neil Stevenson. So needless to say, Barnes is a big ol' nerd. A big ol' nerd who is fueled by energy drinks like most nerds are in real life, with Armageddon being Barnes' favorite brand. Which is ironic considering that Barnes spends all of her time trying to help stop monster Armageddons with Monarch. After one of Barnes' instruments alerts Barnes of a global rise in gamma radiation only found in pulsars from outer space, we learn that Verdugo has the role of assistant director of Monarch, essentially making her the vice president of the whole secret shindig. The show then brings us on a journey back in time to Tokyo 2014, a year before the present day events of the show. We meet up with a 2014 Kentaro and learn that he is an artist who is about to open his first ever art show, which should be exciting, but yet he is still struggling with a deep sense of unhappiness before what should be one of the most exciting moments of his career, in large part because he had this immense anxiety around his art exhibit not being good enough to further his art career and make his father proud, because his father believed in his artistic abilities so damn much. But another major reason why I believe Kentaro is deeply avoidant of his own exhibit is that he didn't really feel like that exhibit was a true expression of his passions as an artist. And we see this shown best when Kentaro and May's first date brings the two on over to Kentaro's art-filled apartment later on, with all the art in his apartment being reflective of the type of art that Kentaro actually likes to create. Kentaro seems to be a big fan of capturing faces in his art, but unlike the human faces that light up his exhibit, the faces that Kentaro actually likes to draw come in the form of various cultural masks of Japan, in particular the Japanese Oni mask, which have been used in traditional Japanese ceremonies in the hopes that these creepy ass faces of these masks will be enough to scare off evil spirits and monsters and bring about peace and protection for the wearer, which I thought was super symbolically fitting for the son of a man who spent his entire life researching how to protect humanity from monsters with Monarch, while simultaneously putting on a fake mask for both of his families in order to protect them. And a lot of Japanese samurai wore demon-themed masks into battle in order to strike fear into their enemies as well, which is why we can see drawings of such samurai on Kentaro's wall, and also why Kentaro likes to wear slippers designed with black and white samurai at home. This all being said, through his art, we can definitely see Kentaro's strong affinity for wanting to defend and other people. I mean, hell, the very first time we're introduced to Kentaro's artwork in May's apartment in an earlier episode, we can see that Kentaro willingly chose to depict an image of a sci-fi soldier holding a big-ass gun facing to fight a giant spider monster. So it definitely feels like Hiroshi Randa's protective nature imprinted onto his son, which makes sense considering how Hiroshi basically left Kentaro alone with his mom to be the man of the house for the majority of his life. So that was basically the type of role that Kentaro was forced into from an early age due to his father's 
monarch monster hunting. But anyways, though demon type masks seem to dominate Kentaro's room, we can also see a couple of Japanese masks of smiling women called an Okame mask, which have been traditionally worn by women to bring about good luck, good health, and joy into their lives. But despite his exhibit not being truly reflective of himself as a creator, Kentaro's artistic fascination with faces and masks led him to create what his exhibit describes as an exploration of parallels and interiors that invites the viewers to challenge challenge their assumptions about identity, which is a detail I found to be the most interesting because we see that reflected within the cinematography of the show itself, a show about two separate families spanning across two different eras, deeply rooted within the idea of parallels, symmetry, and dualities, much like we can see represented in the intro theme animation of this show, and with the show's various relationships, like the relationship between Kentaro and Mei, Kentaro and Kate, Bill Randa and Lee Shaw, Keiko and Kate, like the show is all about parallels man. Throughout this episode and series as a whole, Kentaro learns to challenge his own assumption about the identity of his mysterious father, and how much Kentaro's own deep desire to make his father proud blinded Kentaro from seeing just how loved he's always been by both of his parents just by being who he is. And this theme of faces continues with the brilliant cinematography of Mei and Kentaro's first meeting and date, because after Kentaro tries to photograph his event poster and accidentally takes a photograph of Mei, the two start flirting in front of the face exhibit poster that hangs on this wall with a giant red streak on it. But what's interesting about this becomes clear when we check out just how this red streak is framed in relation to Mei and Kentaro in this scene, with the red streak symbolically shooting from Mei's face all the way to Kentaro's heart. To reflect how Mei herself was seeking to challenge her own assumptions about Kentaro's identity by getting a closer look at his inner heart after she assumed that he was just some pretentious fancy dude just by the haircut that he was forced to get. And when Kentaro and Mei are having their date at the bar, check out this circular white spotlight in the back of the frame. As the two start to get to know each other better, they slowly inch closer together within the bubble of this light. But it's only when this center circular spotlight transitions to the centered circular window of Kentaro's apartment that the two finally feel connected enough for their two faces to come together for a kiss. These two circles captured Kentaro and Mei's faces, just like Kentaro's whole artistic career is about capturing faces in general which I thought was a very nice symbolic touch. But another nice touch that I notice is that when they kiss, Kentaro is purposely placed on the side of the frame with his art desk on it, while Mei is placed on the side of the frame with Kentaro's computer, reflecting their specific areas of expertise. But the only reason why Kentaro even got that kiss in the first place is because my boy whipped out that just trust me move from Aladdin when he held his hand out to Mei on their way to that secret bar. I tried that flirtation technique one time and was immediately pepper sprayed in the face, causing me to cry in the fetal position at my local subway for about 30 to 45 minutes. So, needless to say, your mileage may vary on that one. But anyways, after the kiss, Kentaro leaves while Mei gets another call from what appears to be her sister Lyra, who she brings up to Kate while she fights off her hypothermia. Seeing as this show is heavily themed around dualities, and this caller seems to be deeply attached to the movements of her sister, I would not be surprised to learn later on that Lyra and Mei were actually identical twins with very different personalities, because that would just fit in with the overall theme. But only time will tell on that one. But it definitely seems like we're going to run into Lyra soon at some point in this series. But the most interesting parts of this episode for me, of course, come in the form of radiation. I'm a big fan of radiation, both in the MCU and this universe. Both when Barnes is able to present her radiation findings to assistant director Verdugo and the team at Monarch, and when the radiation of the region caused Shaw, Kate, and May to accidentally walk around aimlessly in circles, because I think these two things are deeply connected. When Barnes is updating Monarch, we learn that these spikes in gamma radiation were sharply correlated with the imminent emergence of a monster, just like it did for Godzilla during his initial G-Day appearance. I believe that this show is deeply implying that the mysterious blue beam of light that Shaw, May, and Kate were following is radiation from the same mysterious blue energy source that flows abundantly inside of the hollow Earth, and is apparently the source of life for all of the titans that come from the hollow Earth through one of the 
many Stargate style wormholes that exist within the planet itself. And since this show is set a full nine years before the events of Godzilla vs. Kong, where the evil company Apex Cybernetics tries to repurpose that hollow earth energy to power their mecha Godzilla, I have a feeling that the narrative of Monarch Legacy of Monsters is going to show us exactly how entities like Monarch and Apex first learned about these wormhole tunnels to the hollow earth and the potential power emanating from the center of the planet. As Team Kong in Godzilla vs. Kong actually head to another cold region of Antarctica in order to access another one of these tunnels in that movie. And since these radioactive wormhole tunnels allow for quick transport across thousands of miles in an instant, this would also serve to explain why the gang got all turned around in the snow. Something about that radiation seems to be manipulating space-time and even possibly gravity to such a degree that it can actually teleport people around without them knowing. Giving credence to young Bill Randa's teleportation theory that he threw at General Pocket in a previous episode about how Godzilla is able to move around the planet so easily. A theory that I brought up in my last video on Monarch Legacy of Monsters, a video that you should check out here. And, and this radiation might actually end up contributing to why Lee Shaw is able to be so spry for a 90-something year old guy, as he has been exposed to kaiju radiation pretty much his entire career. So maybe this ultra-powerful kaiju energy source inside of the hidden earth could actually hold the secrets to human immortality. Like, I feel like that would actually make a really interesting plot point for a future Godzilla or Kong movie in the future, in my opinion. But anyways, when Tim gets to talk to the Monarch team about Barnes's presentation, he again tries to underscore the importance of Bill Randa's files and how they could potentially prevent another monster attack. But I noticed as soon as he said that particular thing, Assistant Director Verduga appears to have a somewhat solemn look on her face, implying to me that she may have lost someone close to her in a kaiju attack herself. But of course, the episode ends with Kentaro eventually finding one of his father's camps and phoning for a rescue from the very people that they were running from this entire time. But I am actually super excited for this next episode because I have got to know just what the hell happened between Hiroshi and Lee Shaw that is motivating Lee to try to find Hiroshi's ass. Because I feel like it's more than Shaw's ties to Keiko and Bill Randa that is pushing Lee to risk his life like this. Like, Shaw definitely knows a lot more than he's letting on, which is why May doesn't trust his ass fully. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Let us know what you guys think of the show in the comments section below. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. You can follow me at Messertainment on Twitter or Instagram or wherever I am on the internet, but most importantly, don't forget to follow Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube because we always got some really interesting stuff for you guys. Yes, thanks again for watching. You guys are amazing, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.